From Chicago's Can TV, a look at the week's events as reported in the newspapers, in the blogs and online, and on radio and TV. This is Chicago Newsroom. And hello again. Welcome once again to another edition of Chicago Newsroom. It's our uh, wall-to-wall election coverage today. You'll hear more about that in a minute. But first of all, the big news is it's telephone book day here at Can TV. Came in this morning, and look, everybody's got their brand new telephone books. So, welcome to the welcome to the old world. I, if you're like me, you've got these things on your porch, and they're every, everywhere you go. There's a bag full of telephone books, and of course, they all go right into the recycling. So, congratulations, and 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 congratulations to the company that bought the telephone books from AT and T. What did they pay seven hundred million dollars for that? <laughs> I mean, who uses them anymore? Well, somebody who, I, who, somebody believes that somebody does, so there you are. I'm sure there are a few people that use them. Probably, yeah, but. yeah. That's Lorraine Fort. She's with Catalyst Chicago. We're going to be talking a lot about education today because th there is so much yeah, education stuff on. in the news, and so we uh, asked her to come by. Joining us for the first time is Don Moore from Designs for Change. Don, it's a pleasure to see you again. I, I think the last time I talked to you was when, oh, many years ago I was doing a radio show and, and you were one of the sort of seminal figures in creating the local school councils and we were talking about mm -hmm. school reform on the radio way back a generation mm -hmm. ago. I'm glad to have you back. And Tom Clark, the ever-present Tom Clark from uh, uh, CMW from Community Media Workshop is here with us today. And uh, we have, we just have so much to cover that I've asked, I've deputized Tom today to be, uh, to be deputy uh, talk show host here to make sure that I don't get dragged down in one thing because we've got to get to about 12 topics well, yeah. on the show. I, I will try to live up to your expectations. Thank you, Tom. Well, he's a veteran talk show host. He knows what he's doing. So as I said, it's election, it's election coverage because you didn't know this, but a mm -hmm. week from today, 18th and the 19th of April, are the elections for local school councils. The reason you didn't know that is because you would have to search high and low in the media in Chicago to even know that an election was going on. And you certainly wouldn't hear it from the Chicago uh, public schools because they've been, well, let's just say reticent to mention it. And uh, that's, uh, that's why we're here today uh, to talk about this. Don, let's, let's just start with you. There was a, there was a fine article in uh, Center Square Journal about this, where uh, th this is a, 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 an organization that does online media up in um, Lincoln, Square. Uh, Lincoln, Lincoln Square, Square, up in that whole area up there. And, and they wanted to print the names of the people who were running for school councils in their district. Mm -hmm. And the Chicago public schools told them they'd have to FOIA them to get the names? What's going on here? Well, there have been a whole series of obstructions by the school system of the effort to recruit uh, LSC candidates. And you would think that uh, you would want grassroots demo democratic participation in the schools, but the school system on an operational level really doesn't, uh, puts a number of barriers in the way. Well, I mean, this, is, this, is, this brings us to a very interesting sort of point in history because when were the first LSCs seated? About 20 years ago? In 1989. 89? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's years. been over 20 yeah, years. Yeah, 22 it's, years. Maybe this is we're, a, we're older than we think. This is the 11th election. This is the 11th election. So, I mean, they, they were very, very much uh, welcomed and ballyhooed when they, when they first came in, and, and they've been pretty enthusiastically embraced by a lot of people. I, I think it's fair to say even Mayor Daley was kind of you know, willing to go along with them or something. No, no? is that yeah. am I going too well, far? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, right now. Yeah. I was trying to give you a little thing, Mayor. He tried, to, <laughs> he tried to take their power away from them twice in the legislature. Right. So, that's well, okay. Yeah. Well, there's that. Other than yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a good point. No, but but what I what I was I guess trying to say is that now we have a new administration. We have not only a new mayor, but we have a new CEO of of CPS and. It really seems like the, the word has come down that we're going to just sort of like suffocate this thing and just get it out of the way as soon as we possibly can. Is that, is that unfair? Well, you know, this has been going on, you know, for a while. I mean, I, I, I would, to me it's more best described as probably just, you know, benign neglect. We know 
you know, the election is going to take place. You know, they'll make some efforts to, you know, put some posters up or, you know, at the library or on the, the train line, the L line or something. But not pour a whole lot of resources into recruiting people. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the private foundation community used to put a lot of money yes. into it. Yeah, yeah. They've shifted and now they're saying, okay, you know, we're going to mm -hmm. move on to something else. So, you know, it's more like, okay, this was tried, you know, there's been some success, you know, but now but things are, let's, let's, let's try let's something go on, else. Let's go yeah. on to something well, else. Well, I mean, there, there are, there, there, yeah. there are many partners who are culpable about the diminishment yeah. of the role of LSCs, including the media, including mm -hmm. politicians, including several CPS administrations. Mm -hmm. And as I look at it, LSCs, elected local community leaders and parents, were at the core of school reform 1988. Mm -hmm. And in fact, up through the middle 90s, when Daly shifted powers mm -hmm. to more downtown Paul Vallis central administration, there was a lot of community excitement. And indeed, the role the media played is that they found those three or four schools each year for which there was conflict yeah, yeah. between the principal right. and the LSC. And the I mean, LSC. democracy is messy. Mm -hmm. But that, in fact, was at the core getting community ownership over that important institution right, right. that had been wallowing for years and well, uh, including appointment and contracting with the principal. I would say that uh, there are still several hundred schools where the LSEs are functioning pretty much the mm -hmm. way the original right. the, law way, the way it was intended. Right. Well, it and there are people who uh, so we, we have 65, in the end, we have 6,500 candidates running uh, next week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would say that the, the uh, reduction has been partly in grassroots participation, but even more in the fact that the media simply doesn't Cover them. It's just not a story, and it's yeah. assumed yeah. that yeah. Uh, if they're not covered, they must not exist. Well, I, part of the part of the reason why I really wanted to talk about this today and and try to elevate this in the importance is is th we talked a few weeks ago about this study that you did, Don, the des right. designs for change, where you were talking about this was this was in the context of schools that are being closed or redesigned or whatever the the phrase turned is around. this week turned around. Turned around. And and you. Uh, you point out that in your study that in those kind of those those schools that are in very difficult neighborhoods where where you know we always think of these as being kind of like the struggling schools the ones that are doing the best in that genre of schools are the ones that have strong democracy that have local school councils that are functioning That's right. So they really are still playing an important role in a lot of schools and it seems a little Strange that you'd want to that you want to kill that off. If it, well, maybe that's too strong. But to to benignly benignly neglect that mm -hmm. force. Well, but it, it, from the it, it's always easier to go in from the district's perspective and say, okay, we're gonna you know get a new principal and fire all the teachers because that's more easily controlled. Mm -hmm. As opposed to okay, we're going to support this grassroots We're going to work with the parents, and, and you know. Uh, but you know, if you look at research, one of the components of you know improving a school, yes, you need good teachers, yes, you need good principals, but you also need community and parent involvement, and mm -hmm. that's what mm -hmm. local school councils provide. Right. Well, I think another thing they provide is they provide an opportunity for teachers to participate as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and for the uh, local council to select their own principal but then right, the principal right. has had a lot of leeway so mm -hmm. the whole law that was passed in 88 really shifted authority down to the school level not just for print uh, not mm -hmm. just for parents mm -hmm. but also for teachers and principals and that is being reversed as uh, as well, or that's being contested as and well. And I think to the extent that LSCs didn't take in some places, that's where an Office of Community Engagement, which has had a budget for years at CPS, could have done uh, more aggressive training and yeah, education yeah, to, yeah. to help those more troubled schools. And that's not the way right. several administrations have right. looked at it. They've right. seen it as more of a bother. and. 
So it was left to nonprofits like Don's organization to try to make up for that. And he, he can't deal with 600 right, schools all on his own. Right. There's 40 well, maybe a year that you can concentrate on trying to help along as you do parent training and other stuff. And mm -hmm. that's important. And I may be undercutting how many schools you're working in, but over time, you know, Designs for Change has done just a lot of good support work and mm -hmm. a few other groups, but they're all minimally funded for right. this work compared but, but to what is, CBS Lorraine, itself could right, be doing. But there is not, you know, foundations too, they put money, a whole lot of money into it, and then they started pulling back but, but, too. And then Mayor Daley got, mm -hmm. you know, more control of the school system right, in, right. in 1985, and so the attention shifted to what he's going to do as opposed to what and, grassroots And one other doing. factor, we, you know, have gone from 10 to 15 to 100 charter schools. That's mm -hmm. the darling. Right, right. This is right. not going to be have, an anti-charter school them. wrap here, but mm -hmm. they don't have to have LSEs. Right, right. right. And um, neither do, you know, their schools, you know, if you're on academic probation, mm -hmm. your local school council doesn't have the same authority. And, and you know, I, to, to attempt to sort of represent what I think might be Mayor Emanuel's view of this, he came into office looking at a school system that the University of Chicago analyzed and said that in 20 years it essentially hadn't moved at all. And, and right. you think about all the money that has been spent and all the millions of hours that have been spent trying to make the school system better and at least from a you know, from a testing point of view, it didn't it didn't improve. So there there would be an impetus to say, screw that, we're getting rid of all of this. I'm but going to bring yeah, somebody see, who's going to fix these but schools. But see, here's the thing. You okay? And and that I, I saw that study, and they it was very rigorously done, everything. But you're looking at a universe of 600 schools, and that's not to say that there are not pockets here and there that are doing well mm -hmm. that could provide you know a model mm -hmm. for right. for other schools so you know now you have to target your your attention to the places that aren't pockets right, right. and you can't you know to indict the whole system because overall you know there hasn't been much movement. That's always been so. one of the things about We're, covering the Chicago public school system is it's so, right, it's, it's it, so right. varied. Right. We, we did a study uh, about uh, eight years ago that showed that there were 145 low-income schools mm -hmm. that had made major achievement gains. And we looked at the practices of those schools and they had active parents, teachers who were involved in decision making, and uh, principals who had a vision but also were very inclusive. So. Uh, mm -hmm. I agree exactly that within the larger picture, if you take an average of all the schools, mm -hmm. yeah, not much has, Im right. has right. improved. Right. But if you look at uh, the set of schools that have done the kinds of things that research shows make a difference, mm -hmm. there's been mm -hmm. a big improvement. Mm -hmm. I'm, yeah. I'm probably going off on a weird tangent here, but I see some interesting parallels to the you know the story we're seeing today that uh, the, the the murder rate is the, the numbers of yeah, murders I, are just dramatically that's up. That's just horrifying. I heard that story and, and, on the on and the radio And shootings today. also it's dramatically like up. And that that you kind of see the the uh, some of the same dynamic. It's like okay, enough of this. I want somebody to come in here and fix this. Or, you know, it's like a Saturday Night Live thing, right? Just fix it. So we're going to, you know, years of trying to do community policing and try mm -hmm. to see if there's a way to make the communities and the police work together. Forget it. Let's just get in there and let's get let's get people in there who know how to stop the shooting. Well, and the story behind that story is that the city never really fully implemented community policing. The program mm -hmm. that that Mayor Daley put in was not community policing, mm -hmm. and in fact, the cops who were in it were new hires who could not rise up to the system in the conventional way because their, the nature of their work was different in terms mm -hmm. of community mm -hmm. engagement. Mm -hmm. So they didn't have the arrests or, or other cases like that that allow one to move up in your career. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. without those points, people quickly moved out of CAPS. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And mm -hmm. then it was declared to be ineffective right. and defunded and not emphasized, just like, hmm, LSEs. <laughs> Somehow <laughs> we, seen it before. we have moments where we discover that community engagement, whether it's around Policing or education is going to be important, but then when we try it, it gets messy. Well, and we it drop is messy. It. It's hard. That's the difference. It's and, hard. And not uh. to say you know anything, 
you know, bad about the, the CAFS program, but is that what is really going to stop the murder rate from going up? I mean, if you look at where the murders occur and the circumstances, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of it is gang related, mm -hmm. of course. Is that addressed by community policing? Well, one thing that I think gangbangers aren't coming to CAFS meetings. But one thing you, <laughs> that I think you would have to say is that these are also communities where the relationship with the police is the most dysfunctional. Oh, they, well, and yeah. And so, yes, if that's if, true. if there were a way that you could knit the community and the police together, it's it's the exact same discussion I would think, Don, that you were having 20 years ago but about in, the schools. Well, yeah. but and also. I would add if you could link the schools with the police and the neighborhood, that would be one of the most powerful mm -hmm. ways to mm -hmm. uh, right. reduce crime because there's all kinds of research that shows that students who are in school are less likely to be involved in criminal activity. But then, then you get into a whole different dynamic where you have the aldermen who are, who are themselves beginning to feel like they're becoming more and more irrelevant with almost every passing day. I mean, they always well, were rubber stamps. Their, I mean, if you're going to be a rubber stamp, then you're making yourself irrelevant. I mean. But, <laughs> but the, the, the difference, uh, the way I always saw it, Tom, is that, is that the aldermen were rubber stamps when they were sitting in the, in the city council. But when they were out there in their offices, they were little mayors. They, they were, were little mayors. They were running and, and, things. And they, still and they don't get trying. to do as much of that anymore. No, you know, they have a discretionary budget each year that's worth less as the city charges yeah. more per mile for a new right, paved street. Right, right. Um, <clears throat> we, we, I'm in a ward where we have, um, we actually have a, a grassroots um, determining what the capital budget priorities ought to be. Participatory budgeting. What do you live on Rogers Park? I'm in Rogers Park. Uh, oh, okay. And, and, um, <laughs> And uh, it's, it's something that really engages the community. There's lots of talk about which streets ought to be done next or mm -hmm. where a mural ought to go in or what mm -hmm. kind of after school program ought to happen. Yeah. And we have community meetings about it and then we vote on it. Mm -hmm. And that's what sets the alderman's agenda for that budget. There, there was a, a, a dramatic, I thought, moment yesterday in the, uh, in the, the uh, committee hearing where the, uh, r the speed camera thing advanced where uh, an alderman uh, asked, asked Gabe Klein, the secretary, or the, not the secretary of transportation, he's the commissioner of transportation, asked him point blank, if I don't want a speeding camera in my ward, do I have the right to reject it? And the answer was very blunt. It was, no. No. <laughs> we're we're going to make that decision for you because right. we know best. Right. Because we know and, best. And I will say <clears throat> that this is a theme for for. I mean, I'm, I, I wish the new mayor a year ago all the best of luck because of all the problems he was coming in to tackle. Mm -hmm. But I work for a different candidate because I was afraid of this daddy knows best kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's, we've seen a lot of that. Mm -hmm. He's made some very impressive moves on some things, but there is mm -hmm. constantly, whatever issue you want to bring up, there is a, well, we know best. And, and we'll take care of it for you. Well, and you better well, go along with us. I, I, I think that uh, that's manifested in the schools. Mm -hmm. I think that the mayor has tended to try to take complex educational issues and turn them into uh, a bumper stick. Political issue. <laughs> yeah. Like we need a longer school day. We need a longer school day. Politicians though, do that all the time. And, and to. And you know, from my perspective, to bring up a longer, since we're talking about briefly about a longer day, Chicago does have the shortest school day in the in the in the country, or one of the shortest. And you know, you can't say, okay, we're going to make the day longer and everything's going to be great. That's not mm -hmm. true. But there does need to be a longer school day and a, and a longer year. And we could talk about that mm -hmm. this whole half hour. Well, I don't, too, I don't think I've I don't think I've ever seen anybody who you could take seriously, say that the school day is the right length. I, I, right. There seems to be great agreement. Like, how are you going to pay for it? You but, know, but yeah, and, and well. then the question is, if you're going to lengthen the day, how about we're lengthening the day because we have all this wonderful stuff we want to cram right. in right. and we don't right. have enough time, so let's right. lengthen the day instead of let's sort of like blow up the balloon and then figure out right. what we're going to put into it. 
And that, bringing us back to our, our beloved mayor, uh, brings us to this same question again. Is this, a, is this a political tactic that we're seeing all the time now where, where the mayor just comes in and says, I want 25 million. And then everybody says, you can't possibly have 25 million. You can only have five. And he says, okay, we'll settle for 20. And then we're, see, that's great. He's a compromiser. I mean, that's kind of what we're seeing happening. It happened with the red light cameras. They, yes. they, uh, I'm sorry, the speeding cameras. They took it down to only $35, friends. It's like, we got a special today only. <laughs> if you pass it today in council, exactly. we'll take the fine down from $50 to $35. And if you'll go along with me on the, lo on the longer school day, I'll bring it down to seven hours instead of seven and a half. And uh, th this seems to be the way it's going. It's just kind of right. like, well, okay, but, I'll give you a deal. But there's no discussion of that involves people, uh, either teachers or parents, about how that extra time is going to be used. Well, why would you need that? The, the mayor hmm? knows what we need to have. Why would, you see, that's the problem. You people all want discussion. You want, you want democracy. You want to have councils and stuff. And, and we've got to get stuff done. And things like that. Uh -huh. right. And uh, to me, the more the question is not so much that, but where is the money going to come from? For whatever it is you're going to do, where is the money? Because they're looking at a deficit of, of seven hundred million. So how is that going to be paid And the, the schools that did do the sample longer day all got a they lot got, of money thrown. They at got them. money one time. Right, one time. One right. time. Right. Yeah. So where is it going to come from next year for six hundred? And and a, and another interesting question is, all of the stuff we're talking about, partly we're being protected by a watchdog news media, the, the news media is protecting us, right? And we're now seeing that the Chicago Sun-Times under new ownership, which is basically a bunch of Rahm Emanuel's friends who now own the newspaper, they're doing some very interesting things with the Sun-Times. And Tom, I know you're a journalism maven. What do you think? Well, for a paper that's been shrinking, mm -hmm. but still has great columnists, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. has great watchdog journalists, yes, um, basically made the Kochman case Yes, um, absolutely happen, correct. So that there's Got a special a prosecutor. Prize. Won a Pulitzer um, last year. You know, year. that tradition continues, but in a very shrunken state. Mm -hmm. And they're mm -hmm. clearly trying, the new ownership is clearly trying to brighten up the bright one. Remember mm -hmm. that campaign the bright years one. ago? Yeah, yeah. And uh, get more people to pay attention to it. I think they have a long way to go beyond the print product mm -hmm. um, uh, to particularly improve what's happening on the web and the mm -hmm. new ownership clearly wants to be paying some attention to that because that's where news is headed, is yeah, online. Yeah. And uh, the Sun-Times historically has not been quite up to speed mm -hmm. um, on, on what they've done on the web. They also have a phenomenal suburban network, which we don't hear or think about that much, but that's clearly part of their, a big Absolutely. part of their business plan in mm -hmm. terms of the, mm -hmm. the footprint they want to do here. I think it's too early to say what this almost daily tweaking of <laughs> The layout Today's is going to mean, right. uh, you know, I'm I'm looking for the substance, not the yeah, gloss. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't mind the more color. I'm concerned that you know Mark Brown is buried in the middle instead of up front where I mm -hmm. think he deserves. He mm -hmm. deserves almost Mike Reichel kind of mm -hmm. uh, standing in terms of placement Agreed. of the paper. Mm -hmm. But they're using that for ads now yeah, um, in the yeah. front of the paper. So. We'll, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, and I, I just have to say, I, I, I absolutely hate ads on the home page of a newspaper, no matter whether it's my beloved sometimes or some, <laughs> I, I just don't, I just don't like it. Well, this it. is but the, you new, know, the new the way they do it now, they, they, they do two front pages, so yeah, if you don't like that front yeah, page, I, here, here's another one. There's another one, one with, <laughs> a, with another ad on that, yeah, but, yeah. you know, it's still the Sun Times and it's still, you know, the hardest working It is paper. the hardest working I mean, newspaper. In, and in, yeah, it right, is, right, I mean, it's right, a little newspaper right. that could, yeah. you know. I, I, I love that characterization. And we'll People see if that keep predicting that it's gonna die, it's gonna die. Right, right. And they keep it's, plugging along. And they mm -hmm. keep plugging along because the people there it's, just it's work really interesting. I'm sorry, Don. Well, it's interesting to me that there, except for an editorial in the Sun Times, there's been absolutely no coverage of the local school councils, to, yeah, yeah. the largest municipal election mm -hmm. in the United States, mm -hmm. no coverage of that yeah, at all, yeah. and uh, uh, the, uh, a small community uh, newspaper called uh, uh, Center North Square, Center Journal, Journal yeah. mm -hmm. did really 
a very in-depth investigation yeah. about how the school system was right, obstructing right, right. the candidate uh, mm -hmm. uh, recruitment process. But you never see any stories like that in the major newspapers. Well, I, I, I just want to make one other observation about this that, that <laughs> in a sense, this is kind of the same thing we've been talking about because Rob Feeder on Monday morning had a, a, just a blistering yes. uh, a blog post about the New Sun Times where he was just, he just took it to pieces, his old newspaper. And on Monday, indeed, the paper was a little weirder than we've seen it in a long time. There was a, like a full page uh, Danica Patrick in a bikini in the sports section. and all. Yeah. But the weird part about it is that by Wednesday, they had pulled back on a lot of this. And there was a, there was a kind of a non-apology. I don't know if you saw it on Wednesday. They had a little box yes. saying, oh, pardon our dust. We're making a few changes. And <laughs> yes, it is true that you know our columnists and our editorials were stuck back behind the uh, obituary. obituary. But that was only because yeah. of the press. We needed to put color. But, you know, but we're working on it. And then, of course, by Thursday, it's mm -hmm. back to pretty much the same way it was before. So... You know, they're feeling their way around, and right. I, I think we all agree here that we want the Sun-Times to oh. succeed, and, and we it, it's fun to to poke fun at them when they're doing all this stuff, but, but they by God, the they have to. But they won the last year, right. yes. and the, the Tribune did not. And Interestingly, you know. did you notice that about, I, I, I went back and tried to look and see, sometime around March 15th, they took that off. They used yes. to run that up here, a Pulitzer Prize winner. They don't yeah. run it anymore. <laughs> maybe it's been a year. And maybe it's that's been a it. year. So yeah. uh, I'm going to pick, pick up an up. earlier thread yes. here that kind of goes through what the Sun Times is you doing. You got one minute. Pick it the, up quick. The uh, well, you were asking before, where's the money going to come from? And the one story we don't have time to get into is Mayor Daley having finally to testify oh in the Birch case. Oh, yeah. And I'll just yeah. say that over the time that he has stalled and that case mm -hmm. has continued on, City of Chicago has paid 14 million dollars in legal fees and it has also paid out more than $22 million in settlements. Now, I don't know how much those figures are going to keep certain schools open or even pay for turnaround stuff. But that's a lot of taxpayers' that money is, going yeah, out yeah, in litigation yeah. that right. maybe could have been taken care of 20 years ago right. if the prosecutors at the time had stopped what people knew was going on on the south side in certain police stations. Could you take 10 seconds and talk about that yellow thing on the, on the thing? You, they're giving us the wrap-up. ChicagoStories.org is, uh -huh. is our effort to help reporters come into Chicago for this summit that's happening in May yeah. to discover the real Chicago. So moving beyond uh, uh, photo ops with diplomats and uh, broken Starbucks windows, if that happens, a whole raft of other stories at chicagostories.org to help these out-of-town journalists. we got to go. Tom Clark, thanks so much for being with us today. Don Moore, thank you very much for coming by today. Lorraine, always nice to see you. you Lorraine too. Fort from The you. Catalyst. You have been watching Chicago Newsroom. It's a community service of Can TV. Of course, you can find us here on cable, but you can also see us at this address, this one right down here. You can watch us anytime. Check us out there. You can also subscribe to us in iTunes. And we were going to get an iBook version, but it turns out they're just too expensive. I'm Ken Davis, thanking you for watching us, and we'll see you next week here on Chicago Newsroom.